I went and looked at dictionaries. And I did want to say that I also looked at this a dictionary of ecology, evolution, and systematics, which is a book I used to assign to my upper division science students. Um, I, I think that the second edition, which is what this is, which uh, was published, the second edition was published in 1998, reprinted in 2003. That's the version I have here. Uh, at least while I was still teaching, they had stopped at the second edition and it wasn't being republished much. Uh, but I went and I decided to look up the relevant terms here. And of course, woman isn't in here because this is a dictionary of ecology, evolution, and systematics. Systematics basically being macroevolution, um, the, the deep history. Um, and it's, it's a fabulous resource. It really is. Uh, female though, I looked up female and uh, to my surprise, not at all, found the egg producing form of a bisexual or dioecious organism compared to male. Okay, so that's all exactly as we have already described. Um, but I thought, oh, right, dioecious. Uh, well, dioecious warrants a, uh, a definition. And while I assumed that both of us could provide one off the top, top of our heads, um, I looked it up in here as well. And it says, used of plants or plant species having male and female reproductive organs on different individuals, unisexual. Um, dioecious um, compared to monoecious or trioecious. And. Trioecious. Right. And so that's where I went, oh, what? Well, I looked up trioecious. And um, let's see, did I, did I tag it? I did. Trioecious. So let's just say um, that di diece, dioecious, is, is what we call hermaphroditism in. Um, no. no, dioecious is um, monoecious is what we call hermaphroditism in animals. So we just, because botanists and zoologists, I don't know, don't get along or just, you know, generated words separately, um, we have, we very often have different words for the same things. Um, so what you would call a uh, hermaphroditic species in an animal, you would call a monoecious species. Monoecious, which means one house. One house, exactly. And so with regard to trioecious, I went, what? What are they talking about? Used of a plant, and this actually this this connects perfectly to what you said about um, sophistry and making an exception for intersex. Used of a plant species having male, female, and hermaphrodite flowers on different individuals. So this is a case in which there are three types of individuals, and we know of no cases, I know of no cases, in which animal species do this. Yep. But a species in which there are male individuals, there are female individuals, and there are simultaneously hermaphroditic individuals. Triaceous, three houses, again, um, and so I actually want to just do a little diversion into Aeacious and mm -hmm. Oikos and everything. Um, but no, there's not some third category. The third category here, the third type of individual is, you know, you have A, you have B, or you have A and B. It's not C. It's not a third thing. It's yeah. not an eighty seventh gender, right? Like it's 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 A and B. It's not it's not a totally new thing. Um, so that sent me just because I went here and I thought it was kind of fun um, into so Ishus, um, which is the same root as um, the echo, actually in ecology and economics, comes from the Greek for oikos. Uh, the Greek meaning household, which is oikos, and indeed there's an ecological journal called oikos. Um, and it has a lot of different meanings actually in Greek, and it turns out to be a very important word. Um, but in looking up what um, what it really means, I found this paper, Lesham 2016, uh, published in 2016 in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Uh, the paper is called Retrospectives, What Did the Ancient Greeks Mean by Oikonomia? Which I guess is the root for um, economics. And I just wanted to share one sentence from this. This is the Journal of Economic Perspectives published in 2016. Um, deep in the article, he says, the earliest appearance of the root word for oikonomia is found in a poem by Phocylides in the sixth century before the common era that reflects the misogynic, he says misogynic, spirit of texts from this age. The poet classifies women by comparing them to different kinds of animals. And advises his friends advises his friends to marry a bee-like wife because she is quote a good oikonomos who knows how to work. Oikonomos is usually translated as steward. <laughs> so that was um, entertaining for me to discover, yes. um, and it it reflects part of why I think some smart people are legitimately confused 
right? That there is, of course, a long history of sexism and misogyny yep. in all of the important intellectual traditions. 100%. We know this. Anyone who claims not is, is lying to themselves or to you. Right. And so we see that here. That doesn't mean, just as you have already said, that there is some, you know, patriarchy that is stealing food from women or, you know, you know, whatever, whatever it is that they are, that they are claiming. But that there are patriarchal structures in place that have in part, um, sort of handed the domain of the domestic to the females and handed the public facing outward domain to men. And that, of course, leaves men with power and resources um, to control is, is of course, true. Um, but that doesn't change the underlying truth of what male and female are. And um, so let me just uh, yeah, follow think, on from that. Yes. This is one of the reasons people uh, who watch this channel or listen to it regularly will have heard me invoke lineage a million times. Mm -hmm. This is one of the reasons that it is so essential that we begin to think evolutionarily in terms of lineage, right? Because as long as the problem is that the individual is more tractable, right? It is easier to comprehend, right? What is the lineage, right? Well, the lineage is actually a fractal, right? You are part of many lineages simultaneously. So it's a little bit hard to wrap your mind around it and what level is operative in any given interaction. Mm -hmm. But until you do, you can start thinking that there is a patriarchy and that that patriarchy is inflicting things on women, right? And the point is, no, that wouldn't really make any sense in a lineage context, right? The lineage may uh, divide things very unfairly. In fact, pregnancy itself is very unfair, right? Tell it's, me about it. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, this is a perfect opportunity for me to mansplain stuff. Yeah. Right. Tell me about how rotten pregnancy can be. Well, but that's just the thing is it's for it, you because you had to live with me. Oh my, no, this is exactly, this is exactly it. Right. Is it. The fact is it is unfairly divided, but it is unfairly divided by biology, not by uh, men being insensitive to women, right? It's non equally divided. Let's just, you know, there are lots of, I mean, look, mm -hmm. warfare, that's dudes. It's, that's also that's, unfairly divided. It's okay. unfairly divided. Sure. Um, but the point is, these things have been divided up because it got our lineage into the future, mm -hmm. right? Now, as you and I make the point in our book, we are up for a renegotiation of a lot of these things. Right. You can't renegotiate pregnancy. We probably should not renegotiate war for the most part, but maybe think about how, you know, that's a short term strategy that's going to make it impossible to live on this planet. But nonetheless, the point is we are handed- We can work together to reduce war. Right. right? But, but, you know- The actual war part. Biology and getting getting into the future is not easy. We got here. We got here with a lot of stuff unevenly divided in lots of different ways, mm -hmm. right? And more evenly dividing that which can be more evenly dividing divided is a good idea. But pretending that this is about somebody being mean, right, is preposterous. That's just not how lineage works. And um, anyway, you know, look. At some point, you know, we've seen the sophists now argue that the reason that women's sports were invented was not to protect women from male competition, but exactly the reverse, right? Yeah. How far can we really be from an argument that women's prisons were invented to protect male prisoners from being assaulted by women who had committed crimes? Yeah. <laughs> right? And female criminals can be rough. <laughs> They can. And so, you know, yes, men invented these uh, women's prisons to protect uh, male prisoners, mm -hmm. right? Um, that argument's coming at some point, presumably. Mm -hmm. And the, we have an obligation to learn how to stop being so damn responsive as if the fact that an argument is difficult to field means that it's valid, right? A lot of these arguments just aren't valid and they're obviously not valid, even if you can't put your finger uh, on the reason why in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I guess the last and that last, doesn't make you wrong, right? Yeah. So I would I would point out that there's a trick that uh, people will use in arguments sometimes, which is if you say something, they will ask you to define a word in what you've said, mm -hmm. right? You will find that if you give yourself the assignment of defining the important words in the arguments you make, it's very difficult, mm -hmm. right? We constantly use words that we cannot define, and that is not 
an indication that we are fakers. It is an indication of the way the meaning of words is held. It's not held in the conscious mind in a place that you can immediately bring up the, you know, the, the meaning of any of the things that you're saying. And so, um, you know, the sophists can use this against you until you realize that your inability to define a word is not an indication that you don't know what it means, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I guess, you know, let's stop being backed into a corner by this stuff. Excellent. Thank <laughs> you.